welcome everybody. Um, there are still people coming in, but I think we should get started in respect for all of the people uh, who are here at the moment. Um, over 300 of you here talking about uh, mental health in the uh, city. I think that's a, a great demonstration of interest in this project, um, in this uh, topic. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Kwam McKenzie. I'm the CEO of the Wellesley Institute. And wow, can you hear that? <laughs> so the ground moves when you talk about this subject. It's amazing. Um, uh, so great. Uh, so really, transformational change. Uh, my name is Dr. Crabbe McKenzie. I'm the CEO of the Wellesley Institute. The Wellesley Institute is trying to improve health and uh, uh, well-being in the city and health equity in the city through research, policy, uh, convening, and talks like this one. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Nicholas Rose about uh, mental health, the urban brain, migration, and the megacity. Um, and then that will be followed by, and um, we're really delighted also to have uh, Elliot Capel, who will give us his reflections, and he is the Chief Resiliency Officer uh, in Toronto. After that, there's going to be a chance for you guys to uh, uh, have questions, so there'll be questions and answers um, with uh, Professor Rose and Elliot. Now, you have to be nice to Professor Rose. He, he only came in on a plane yesterday. And I, I thought you guys would be so scary that while he was jet lagged, we'd have him here to soften the blow of the difficult uh, questions you're going to ask him. So uh, be nice to him, yeah? Uh, proper Torontonians, please, yeah? Yeah, good, all right. Okay, so the Wellesley Institute and CAMH uh, PSSP are interested in mental health and interested in mental health in the city. And lots of people worldwide are having these discussions. And the reason for that is more of us are living in cities. In 1950, 30% of the world population lived in cities. By 2050, it will be 70%. In Canada, 80% of people live in cities. And in Ontario, 85% of people are living in cities at the moment. Now, Anybody who follows me in, in, Twitter, in Twitter knows that I love cities. Uh, over the last year, um, I've tried to do it every day, so we've had 250 tweets about uh, that are hashtag uh, why I love Toronto, uh, which sort of gives it away a bit that I might like cities. I find them vibrant, it's multicultural, there are new ideas, there are innovations, it's just a great place to be, uh, and I, I love Toronto. Uh, but despite that, I realize, and uh, everybody realizes that cities are stressful. 20% uh, of us in this room will suffer a mental health problem in our lifetime. Civic Action recently did a study which showed that 1.5 million workers in the GTA are suffering from mental health problems at the moment. So cities are wonderful, but they're stressful. Now, there's lots going on. Uh, the Mental Health and Addictions Leadership Advisory Council, which is a group that uh, advises government, uh, has been working hard to try and improve mental health services. Um, you'll have heard that there are going to be new uh, mental health hubs for youth. Uh, you'll have heard that 10,000 people each year, new people, are going to have structured psychotherapy. And they've agreed uh, from some of the work that we've been doing with them in Wellesley at a target of 30,000 new people with mental health problems being supported in their housing. So there's, there's lots going on. And there's a big system transfer, uh, transformation that's going on to try and improve mental health services. Uh, but, you know, at Wellesley, we deal with the social determinants of health. And we believe that service transformation to produce equitable services is great and it's really important. But that's not going to get us to where we want to be. We have to look at the social determinants of health, and we have to look at you know, where we live, how we live, uh, if we're actually going to be able to thrive. So the questions that we're really asking is, how can we set up cities to ensure that they increase our ability to thrive, decrease the risk of developing mental health problems, but also 
offer good supports so that people with psychosocial problems uh, can move forward and recover. So that's what we're interested in. And we're particularly interested uh, in uh, vulnerable groups. And as you know, in uh, Toronto, 50% uh, of the people here are not from here. So me, for instance. Um, you know, 50% of us were born elsewhere and we're migrants. And so when we're thinking about Toronto and thriving and mental health in this mega city, we also have to think of uh, how we deal with uh, mental health uh, for migrant populations. And so bringing this all together, plus adding ideas of what we know from the literature and from neuroscience, that's what Nicholas Rose is all about. And that's why we're really, really happy to have him here. This is the second thing we've done. Uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we had Gary Belkin here. How many of you are here for Gary Belkin? Excellent. So Gary Belkin, all of you who weren't here, you just missed out. That's, uh, that's about it. Uh, but we will, we will put a, it's a, a, a video on, on our site and also on the CAMH site, which will allow you to see what you missed and to feel envious of the people who are here. Um, but uh, Gary Belkin runs something called Thrive New York City. New York City are investing $1 billion over a four-year period to try and improve well-being and improve the mental health of people with psychosocial difficulties, $1 billion, and it's taken off. They think that mental health is everybody's business and that this is a fundamental thing that you need to do uh, to make cities really work. And it's, it's really exciting, and it was really exciting to have him here, and there's still a bit of a buzz around about what he said. And this is the second event, and it's three times as big. And I believe that at the end of this, there'll be a similar buzz about the possibilities, what we know, what we don't know, what we might want to do to think about how to make this city a better place. I'm going to pass over now to Loris Bedorcha, who's one of the VPs at CAMH, who's, uh, the, and they're the partners in this event. Uh, but I, before that, I just wanted to make sure that I recognized uh, Rob Moore, uh, who is the executive director of the, um, of the <sighs> Provincial System Support Program. Uh, I actually have an appointment there, and I still can't get it right, um, because we call it PSSP. And the reason I wanted to acknowledge him is he was one of the early thinkers about this idea of thinking about uh, mental health in the city and what cities can do to move things forward. And so we're really happy to be able to partner uh, with the provincial system support program uh, that I just rolls off the tongue as soon as people prompt me. Um, uh, so, Laurie. Tough act to follow, I think. Um, Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to echo uh, Dr. McKenzie's comments about how excited we are to co-host this evening and the evening that we uh, co-hosted with Gary Belkin. This is a really important and timely issue. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, is an academic health sciences center devoted to mental illness and addiction, uh, the largest one in the country. And we're at uh, Queen and Ossington, the hub at Queen and Ossington. Uh, we have a really unique role um, in addition to our uh, leadership in clinical care and research and education. Uh, Rob's program, the Provincial System Support Program, um, is a unique role in system leadership. So we help uh, the province to build capacity uh, in mental health in cities and communities uh, actually across the province. Um, so this is a really timely uh, conversation and a great partnership between CAMH and the Wellesley. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat some of the stats that uh, that Quam's already gone over, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, suffice to say that this is uh, really important, both from a city's perspective and where we're at uh, within the mental health system. Uh, we certainly have seen a, a growth and openness in the conversation around mental health and lots of action from different governments across the country and certainly at the federal level. So we're ready to take it, I think, to a to a new level. Uh, before coming here tonight, I thought about the evolution of one particular Toronto neighborhood. 
so the Cam H neighborhood, actually uh, West Queen West, not too far from here at Queen and Ossington. It's our 27 acre site, uh, home, to the mental health, home to mental health services since it was called the Provincial Lunatic Asylum in 1850. Um, historically, the site was situated outside the city limits. And now with immense growth, we find ourselves in the middle of one of the most popular neighborhoods, actually listed as one of the hippest neighborhoods, I think, by Vogue magazine. Our transformational redevelopment is a very intentional symbol of the future and the effort to overcome stigma and build awareness and understanding. And we're just about to break ground in October for our third phase. Um, Nicholas was saying that he passed by today uh, to see the grounds and uh, the hoarding's not quite up yet, but there'll be shovels in the ground very soon. Um, our commitment is twofold. It's uh, building dignified and safe spaces for the best possible care for our patients and becoming one with the neighborhood. I think this is really key for us, literally and figuratively letting down the walls of the asylum and working together to construct a dynamic and healthy neighborhood in West Queen West. A true collaboration in city building. Um, a bit of a microcosm, so I think we're ready to grow and sort of look at the full city of Toronto and what the power that we can, um, we can all collaborate together to, uh, to make a change. So tonight, through our Provincial System Support Program, again, we're happy to, um, to with our friends at the Wellesley, to co-host. We're looking forward to hearing Dr. Rose's thoughts on how to build cities and make us well. And we hope that this will spark some more important discussions amongst you and your organizations, and more impo importantly, to act and promote mental health and well-being of all Torontonians. So thank you very much for coming. So have you ever had the feeling that you'd really like the ground to open up and suck you in uh, when you completely forget uh, uh, the name of the department that you work in? Have you ever had that? Yes. No, 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 maybe not. Okay, so now uh, to the main act. Uh, professor Nicholas Rose is a professor of sociology and the head of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. He asked us to do a short bio, um, which um, uh, where we, we are going to um, uh, we're going to do. Uh, but even that is pretty amazing. He trained as a biologist, uh, a psychologist, and a sociologist. His work explores how scientific developments have changed conceptions of human identity and, and, and governance, and what this means for our political, socio-economic, and legal futures. Amongst a long list of accomplishments, he is notably a member of the Science Policy Centre Advisory Group of the Royal Society uh, and the Steering Committee of the Social and Ethical Division of the EU-funded Human Brain Project. His particular contribution is to explore the project's social, ethical philosoph and philosophical implications and promote engagement with decision makers and the public. His current work discusses how urbanization is affecting our mental health, and that's what we'll be talking about today. We are really grateful uh, to have Professor Rose and welcoming him here with a, uh, a really hearty welcome. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks uh, very much to Kwame for his introduction and for giving at least 15% uh, of my talk uh, for me. Um, now, uh, just to uh, get the disappointment over first, uh, the questions that uh, the colleagues have raised in introduction are really important, and I doubt that I'm going to answer any of them. Uh, I am a social and political theorist with a particular interest these days in the relationship between the social sciences and the life sciences. And I've had a 50-year involvement with questions of mental health and psychiatry. Uh, a lot of it with psychiatrists and mental health professionals, but most of it from the perspective of what we in the UK call the users and survivors of psychiatry. So I'm interested in this intersection of uh, urban, urbanicity and mental health, but I'm not a policymaker. 
And I hope that some of the reflections that I have today, some of which are historical and some of which are conceptual, might at least give you some uh, food for thought if they don't answer any of those policy questions. And in fact, what I'm going to do today arises out of some research that I've been doing over the last five years with some colleagues uh, from uh, a range of disciplines who I'll mention at the end of the project, comes out of something called the Urban Brain Lab, which we started about five years ago, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Out of that grew a proposal uh, to look at the way in which mental health was shaped by urban environments, in particular in locales, mega cities, which had grown enormously over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, that project was funded by the so-called Newton Fund, uh, which encourages collaborative research in the social sciences and in the natural sciences between the UK and the emerging economies, in this case in China. So a lot of our work was done in Sao Paulo. Um, we recently started doing, sorry, it was done in Shanghai. We've recently started doing work in uh, Sao Paulo, another mega city with a huge migrant population. And we're collaborating with colleagues across Kings, in particular using a, an interesting uh, app, which I hope to talk to you about later, uh, called the uh, Urban Mind app. So why are we interested in the urban brain? Well, I think you've heard quite a lot about that already. Uh, there are six or seven key reasons for that. The first of that is that mental ill health is the largest contributor to the global burden of disease. Now, the data, which I'll show you in a second, is certainly liable to question. All data, all these figures are used for political purposes, as we know, many of them good ones. Uh, but however you cut it, the amount of, uh, of uh, Ill, mental ill health uh, globally uh, outweighs almost any other class of disorder, and yet we know that the funding for research and development in mental health doesn't match that which is given uh, for other disorders. And we also know that the bulk of that uh, work is, um, the bulk of that research is uh, for neurobiological and biological rather than social scientific research. Second, as we've heard, the global population is becoming increasingly urban, whatever that might mean. As we know, cities are a multitude of different environments and we have to understand those multitudes of environments themselves. Thirdly, we know that the urban population has higher levels of mental ill health than the rural population. It's been recognized since the 19th century that mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and even severe psychotic disorders like schizophrenia have a higher prevalence in cities, despite the fact that the population in cities, by and large, is better fed and healthier uh, than their rural cousins. We know that there's been a huge amount of social epidemiology that is to say, marking out, the mapping out the distribution of mental ill health and correlating it with a whole range of other factors, with poverty, with deprivation, with housing, with overcrowding, with racism, with exclusion, and so on and so forth. And these correlations are really interesting. And in some cases, correlations can be very informative. For instance, we understood the relationship between smoking and lung cancer through epidemiological research. But in other cases, correlations can be very misleading. For instance, we thought for ages that uh, stomach ulcers were related to stress, anxiety, and personality type before we discovered that stomach ulcers were largely caused by a bacterial infection, H. pylori. So we need to go beyond correlations to look at mechanisms, but mechanisms still remain obscure. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today, how we can understand these mechanisms. Now, one of the uh, problems in understanding these mechanisms is with the rise of molecular biology and molecular neurobiology, but most uh, leading biological and neurobiological research is extremely reductionist, and it doesn't take much account of social factors. 
but recently there have been developments in biology and neurobiology which allow the possibility of an opening up to an understanding of the way in which the social life of organisms, the social life of human beings, shapes as, and is shaped by their biological and neurobiological life from the moment of conception, if not before. And this opened some really exciting opportunities for these two major branches of the sciences of life, the biological sciences and the social sciences, to begin to work together. And that's really where I started this particular interest. Now, let me just put a little bit of data uh, on the uh, generalizations which I've made, although I can go very quickly uh, because uh, this is well known to you as a result of uh, the earlier discussions. Again, don't trust those figures, but these are just some data which indicate to you the contribution of uh, uh, psychiatric disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders to what's called the global burden of disease. And you can see here in this uh, bluish column, bluish segment here, that contribution. And you can see that unipolar affective disorder or depression to you and I is a major contributor there. And you can look and you can see the comparative uh, contribution of that in relation, say, to the cancers, to cardiovascular diseases, to respiratory diseases, etc., etc., etc. Yet if you look at this diagram over here, this just gives you some indication of the amount of development funding that's spent on these different kinds of disorders. And the green bars indicate the amount. Uh, this is some work by a colleague of mine, Graham Thornycroft and colleagues. Uh, and you can see here, if you can read that, that HIV is by far the major uh, recipient of development funding and mental ill health is right up at the top here. So to, in some way or other, our understanding of the contribution of these different categories of dis disease to human misery and suffering worldwide is somewhat skewed. Too many different uh, things here. Right, now colleagues have already pointed to you to the growth of the urban population. Again, I'm just going to show you these figures to give you uh, some vague indication of what these things look like. As I say, our research has mostly uh, concentrated on developing uh, emerging economies. So this is China. The red line is the urban population. The green line is the rural population. This is Nigeria, red line urban, green line rural. This is Brazil, the same. Uh, this is India. These down the bottom are the advanced economies. This is the UK, where again you can see that there's movement between the rural and the urban, and that is the United States. And if we move now uh, to Canada, you can see, and these are uh, just following up the figures that have been uh, already mentioned to you. This is the urban population of Canada as a whole. That's the rural population of Canada estimated up to 2050. And again, in this diagram here, the red are the estimates of the urban population. The green are the estimates of the rural population. These slides, which come from a presentation that Kwame gave uh, some years ago at our Urban Brain Workshop, are just indications of the immigrant status in Toronto here. Again, this segment here is the non-immigrant people who are born and live in Toronto, about 50%. This segment are people who are not born in Toronto, uh, of whom the major proportion are those who immigrated before the beginning of this uh, century, uh, those afterwards. And you can also see here the maps of where those uh, different types of the population are uh, concentrated. Um, now, as I said very briefly in my opening remarks, there's long-standing evidence about the distribution of psychiatric disorders in urban and rural populations, and these are just some of the many, many, many review articles which show again and again and again that whether it, can't, whether it is a question of the common mental disorders, anxiety, depression, um, and, the, and the phobias, or whether it's a question of the severe psychiatric disorders 
disorders like schizophrenia. There is more, a higher level of prevalence in the cities, however you define the cities, than there is in rural areas. We could attribute some of that at least to measurement issues, to reporting issues, and to all those other artifacts that bedevil uh, data like this. But the results are extremely consistent over the years, over different cities, and in different, and in different countries. Now, one of the groups that's done most of the research on this, uh, on this area is the group led by Andreas Meyer-Lindenberg uh, in Heidelberg in Berlin with Florian Lederbergen and Leila Haddad. This is a recent review that they produced. And what their argument is, again and again, people say something like this. While the urban environment is associated with an increased prevalence of specific mental disorders, many factors have been discussed as contributory, but we don't seem to understand what is going on here. And they argue, as many people do argue, that the major contributory factor is something that they call stress or social stress. And indeed, Kwame mentioned stress at the beginning. So I'll be saying a little bit about stress and its implications later on. Now, as I said, the opportunity for doing this kind of collaborative work that I'm going to talk to you about between the social sciences and the life sciences has come about because of changes within the life sciences itself. And it's rather interesting that if you're an academic like I am, the impetus for this kind of work comes not from the social sciences, but actually it comes from the neurosciences. Partly the reason for this is because finally, at last, molecular neurobiologists are beginning to recognize that they need to understand more about organisms than they can discover by simply studying them at the molecular level in laboratories. This was a very influential paper for our thought by a microbiologist called Carl Woese just before he died, uh, saying that we could see the end of this molecular reductionist view of biology grinding to a halt and that biology was at the point where it had to choose between two paths. One was to go further and further down this molecular level, and the other was to open up to become what he called an emergent science. Now, he called his uh, paper here a new biology for a new century, and we called our research when it first got its funding a new sociology for a new century because it took its inspiration from where we thought biology was going. That is to say, from movements within biology that seem to overcome at least some of the suspicion that social scientists had of biology, biological accounts. Of course, that suspicion was very well grounded. Anybody who knows anything about the history of biological politics in the 19th and 20th centuries, the histories of uh, eugenics, the histories of racism, the history of fatalistic and reductionistic biological accounts of human conduct could be forgiven for being exceptionally suspicious of the entry of biological explanations into accounts of human affairs. But recently we've seen a number of uh, openings emerging within the life sciences themselves, as I say, which begin to place the whole organism back in its environment. And I'm going to say something about a, little, uh, about a few of those later on. Epigenetics, which recognizes that the most important thing for the development, especially of human diseases, is not the genetic complement that you're born with, but the way in which that, which that genetic complement is activated or deactivated across the life course. Neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, the recognition that the brain is perhaps the most open, modulatable, changeable organ of any organ in the body, not just in those critical periods of youth, but right up uh, through, the, uh, through the life course itself. The microbiome, the recognition that human beings are not single organisms, but our guts are inhabited by millions and millions and millions of microbes, and the state of those microbes is exquisitely shaped by your environment and also fundamentally related to your physical and mental health. And the exposome, a term that's been uh, coined to recognize the effects of the atmosphere of pollutants uh, on uh, the development of the human beings. Um, 
So we've moved from a situation where people think of biology as destiny to a situation where th people begin to recognize that understanding the biology is also the basis for opportunities for intervention. So the conceptual part of this project that I'm going to talk about is to argue that there is a unique opportunity for collaboration between the social sciences and the life sciences to understand these kinds of issues of health and illness, both at the social and at the corporeal, the cerebral, the biological level. And if there is such a relationship, it should have implications for how we think about our problem of the city. So can we think of the city in a kind of ecological way? The city, of course, is not one thing. It's a complex set of micro-environments, dynamic habitats, in which human beings, as living organisms, try to make their lives. It's a bizarre mixture. Kwame finds it, finds it uh, exciting, convivial. I find it overwhelming, terrifying, noisy. <laughs> the sprawling networks, the concrete mixers, the road diggers, the traffic. And this is something that people have said about cities right from their very inception. This mixture amongst strangers who you've never seen before and you'll never see again, trying uh, to make relationships with them. In your, and your organization of your life being, on the one hand, highly programmed by traffic lights, street crossings and things like that. And on the other hand, completely kind of random. So we live our lives of conviviality, of sociality, but also lives of isolation, exclusion, deprivation, racism, and so on, within these environments. And I suppose that the root of our, of our project is the belief that you've actually got to get down to understanding those environments in which human beings make their lives and the way in which human beings make their lives in those environments in order to begin to get to grips with these questions of mental ill health and how to tackle it. Now, as I say, this question of uh, mental life in the metropolis has been one that uh, has concerned social scientists and intellectuals since the end of the 19th century. In the 1850s, Henry May, who tried to explore the lives and labors of those who lived in the uh, dark interior of London in his books, books uh, London Labor of the London Poor, towards the end of the 19th century, the belief was that this movement of individuals from the countryside to the city was part of a spiral of deterioration or degeneration. Healthy people moved from the countryside to the corrupting milieu of the city, and in that corrupting milieu of the city, their health, their mental health, their physical health, their moral health uh, deteriorated, and they passed that deterioration down to their offsprings, a rather uh, a depressing spiral of degeneration that began to obsess intellectuals in the late 19th century. Charles Baudelaire himself, who coined the term modernity, thought of maternity as epitomized in the ephemeral, the transient, the fleeting experiences that people had in cities. And Walter Benjamin as well thought the same about this, the disintegration of coherent experiences in the cities. And perhaps this was most uh, eloquently expressed in a classic lecture by George Zimmel uh, in 1903 called The Metropolis and Mental Life in which uh, Zimmel argued precisely the same, that this overwhelming of the sensorium, of the experiences, of the of smell, of noise, of sight, of flashing lights, people, etc., etc., had particular psychological consequences for those individuals who experienced it. It jangled their nerves, it pushed their nerves to an extreme, and it forced people who wanted to live in those jangling excuse me, jangling environments, to develop a kind of blasé attitude in which they separated themselves off in their own little bubbles because that was the only way in which they could survive in these kinds of hectic environments. 
you should note, or we note, that someone like Zimmel was not particularly concerned with whether he was providing a sociological explanation, a psychological explanation, an anthropological explanation, or a neuro neuro neurological explanation. He was concerned with the way in which the city got into, under the skin, and shaped the mental lives of individuals who lived there. Unfortunately, the kind of vitalism that uh, Zimmel thought of about the city was rather, uh, rather short-lived, and the predominant view of what was happening when people were moving from the countryside to the city was, as I've said, that the vices of the cities were productive of insanity. Um, and this was linked also to the development of eugenic policies, in particular in the United States, uh, but also in, in Canada, very strict regulations uh, beginning uh, uh, on immigration uh, to make sure that immigrants were healthy and were not leading to a deterioration of the, of the race. Uh, Francis Amazo Walker in the United States, who was the director of the US Census, was very concerned about what he called beaten men from beaten races, uh, in particular the Irish, Southern, Southern European, uh, Jews and others, and the National Origins Act in the United States, which was actually much admired uh, by the early National Socialists in, in Germany, sought to control the immigration of those people from those races. And even uh, today, I understand there are very strict regulations on immigration into Canada, seeking to make sure that only people who satisfy certain healthy conditions uh, are able uh, to come to uh, this country, and those who don't, certainly in the early years of immigration, uh, were um, uh, uh, sequestered and then uh, deported. Perhaps the earliest work on the city was done by the Chicago School, Park and Burgess, uh, who thought of the city as a kind of vital mechanism, not merely a physical mechanism involved in the vital processes of the people who compose it. Um, and perhaps the first survey of the distribution of psychiatric disorders across urban life was carried out by uh, colleagues of uh, Park and Burgess at the Chicago School, Farris and Dunham, who produced this map of schizophrenia uh, and its distribution across the urban areas of, of Chicago. Their view of, uh, of schizophrenia and of schizophrenics was a, a very doleful one, and I don't wish to endorse it here, but nonetheless, their position was a kind of vitalist one, that somehow what happened in the city, the forms of life that people experienced in the city, shaped their inner life. And there was this constant transaction between inner life and the outer life. So human beings as vital organs and vital organisms were shaped by their immersion in this urban environment. Pretty soon, this idea that there were characteristic patterns of, of uh, diagnosed mental disorders across city space moved from this kind of understanding that it was something about the city that shaped the distribution of mental disorders into a very negative biopolitics of eugenics, of racism, that tried to control those who were deteriorating and who were a threat to the race, and a view that it wasn't really the city that was doing these things to people, that what was happening was that people of weak and feeble and degenerate constitutions were drifting in to the ghettos of the city. This argument that it was urban drift and not the city itself that resulted that had produced the concentration of certain classes of people with certain types of disorders in particular regions of the city. And social scientists, instead of trying to understand this dynamic interchange between the internal and the external, the form of life and the vital life of the individual, moved to a style of thought that was really rather correlational, not at all concerned with mechanisms. As I said at the beginning, what's the correlation between crowding? What's the correlation between uh, ethnic density? What's the correlation of, of deprivation? What's the correlation of poverty? What's the correlation of these various factors? 
And let's not go beyond these factors. Let's just make the maps. And these are some of the maps that were made again and again and again. And when these maps, the maps of mental disorder and the maps of these social conditions were kind of mapped onto one another, then people looked to try and understand what were the factors, what were the key factors that accounted for these distributions. This is in a, a, a town in London called Nottingham. And you can actually see that the distribution, the darkness uh, is the uh, prevalence of, of schizophrenia, diagnosed schizophrenia. You can actually see that these distributions remain remarkably the same, but what is it that's causing this, these distributions? Maps of New York trying to do the same. Can you put uh, the map of the distribution of depression onto the map of distribution of poverty? Or can you put it onto the map of distribution of segregation? And as I said right at the beginning, these correlational styles of thought, and as I quoted from uh, Lederbogen and, and Andreas Meyer Lindenberg and Haddad, uh, these correlations seem to be systematic, but no single factor can be drawn out which appears to account for them. So is it everything or is it nothing? So can we bring to the migrants of our age this kind of vitalistic understanding of the way in which the urban gets into the interior of the body? How would we do this? How would we begin to chart the way in which urban living marks the bodies and the brains of individuals and brings some to frank disorder? And if we understood it better, would some of these questions that we ask ourselves, what's a good city, what's a just city, what are the rights to the city, would they change as a result of these understandings? So, let me just have a little uh, digression and talk uh, specifically about stress. A few years ago, uh, stress seemed to be the major way in which people wanted to talk about the relationship between the outside and the inside. Stress, as this headline says, makes its molecular mark. It's stress that accounts for the way in which the outside experience gets into the interior of the body, or to use the cliche, the way in which adversity gets under the skin. Now, as I say, we've done a lot of work on migration in China, and I won't bore you with this slide because we don't want to talk too much about China at the moment, uh, but we know that something like 300 million uh, people have moved in China from the countryside to the city, making up about 36% of the total population. So we've done a little bit of work on the mental health of migrants in China, actually not something that many people know a great deal about. Um, sometimes their mental health is better, sometimes their mental health is worse than the people they've left behind them or the people that they've lived with. But if you talk about mental health in China, you don't talk about the mental health of the migrants, you talk about stress. China is in the grip of a mental health stress crisis. And the images of those people who are stressed are not your migrant population, but they're these guys or these people in the Shanghai underground. I know how they feel. Or this uh, lady here feeling terribly, terribly stressed. And you can see these bl the blame of stress, rapid social transformation, pressures of work, pressures of children, People using the term stress, yali, or pressure, using the term stress to account for the ways in which the outside of their experience gets into uh, their mental and physical life. Worry and stress rise in China. Lots of people report that they worry. Lots of people report that they're experiencing a lot of stress. And in fact, in China, um, I've done some work previously on the rise of the psi professions. There's a huge boom in the psi professions in psychotherapy and counseling, in group therapy, in family therapy, and so on, as people can't seek to come to terms with this rapidly transforming society. But it's mainly not the migrants who are seeking these psychotherapeutic solutions. Uh, it is the emerging Chinese middle class for whom the term stress has become the key indicator of what happens when you live a life of 
a busy, uh, worry, pressure in urban environments. Stress. So, as I say, some of the most interesting work on stress recently has been done by the group of Andreas Meyer Lindenberg and so on. And the headlines, which I showed you a few moments ago, came largely as a result of the publication of this one particular paper on the relationship between urbanicity and brain functioning. City living and urban upbringing affect neural social stress program in humans. And this led to a lot of publicity, this, this paper, including uh, publicity in uh, the newspapers and including publicity, as we'll see in a minute, in Nature. Um, and what Meyer Lindenberg and his group argued was that for the first time, they had begun to see the way in which stress actually transformed the way in which the brain worked. Or rather, that people who'd been brought up or lived in cities process stress in different kinds of ways. And the way in which they process stress might be linked to their development of psychiatric disorders. Our results, they say, identify distinct neural mechanisms for an established environmental risk factor, that is living in cities, link the urban environment for the first time to social stress processing, suggests that brain regions differ in vulnerability to this risk factor across the lifespan and indicate that experimental interrogation of epidemiological associations, by which they mean trying to find out the mechanisms by which we can understand this distribution of mental disorders and its relationship to social, fa social factors, experimental interrogation of epidemiological associations is a promising strategy in social neuroscience. And this leads to pictures like this. This is a picture in nature of a city that I don't think any of us have ever lived in, uh, but trying to map out, okay, here's a lowly person. Is that stressful? Here's an insecure person. Is that stressful? Here's an annoyed person. Is that stressful? And here, of course, in a cliche that goes back as long and you and I can uh, imagine the idea that if you're in this kind of space, you're going to feel relaxed. Actually, I gave a version of this paper in Canberra, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to Canberra, but if there's one city in the world that looks a little bit like this, it's Canberra, apart from the fact that there'd be only three people rather than all these other people. <laughs> other people here. Stress. Stress and the city. What is stress? So, forgive me for a little historical diversion here, but the first person to really think about stress, well, actually, the first person to think about stress was Walter Cannon, but let's not think about that. Let's think about the most famous stress researcher, Hans Selye. Now, in 1936, Hans Selye had been doing some work with mice as people do. And actually, he'd been trying to develop a new sex hormone, but that's kind of a little bit beside the point. And in the course of trying to develop this sex hormone, he'd injected his mice with every chemical, with every irritant, with every good or bad thing you can possibly imagine. And he'd put the mice in hot and cold, and he'd crowded them. And he'd done all sorts of things which you can do with mice, because nobody really cares too much about mice. And he found something which he called the general adaptation syndrome. He said, okay, if you take mice and you start to stress them, the first thing they do, well, you'll know this from your school, they'll either try to fight or they'll try to flee. So all their hormonal systems will start to build up to try and prevent, pre prepare them to fight or to flight. But if they can't fight, and if they can't flight, if they are stuck in those systems, stuck in those situations where the hormones are sort of being generated all the time, they go through a very, very uh, predictable cycle. And actually, it doesn't matter whether they're stressed by heat, whether they're stressed by cold, whether they're stressed by crowding, whether they're stressed by whatever, the system that they go through, the sequence that they go through is the same. 
And that's why he called it the general adaptation syndrome. They go through alarm, then they go to resistance, then they go to exhaustion because their adrenal glands are pumping out these hormones, preparing them to fight or to flee, and they can do neither of them. So the body responds to any external biological source of stress with a predictable biological pattern in an attempt to restore the body's internal homeostasis. Now, Hans Selye made a career out of trying to understand the stress response, working with thousands of rats and hundreds of researchers and towards the end of his life working in Montreal and writing many books like the one he's holding up there, Stress Without Distress. Okay, rats and mice then. Perhaps we could take rats and mice as models for humans and we could understand stress in humans by understanding stressed rats and mice. Well, this was the perception. I'm cutting a long story rather short here because the last time I gave this paper, people said there are too many rats in it, so I'm trying to <laughs> reduce the number of rats, for which I regret because I like rats, but uh, I, anyhow, there you are. It's, uh, it's uh, not too ratty, this paper. Um, John Calhoun. Okay, John Calhoun, very influenced by Hans Selye's work, tried to understand one specific feature of the rat's response to stress, and that was crowding. And what John Calhoun did was that he built rat cities. He took some rats, and you can see them there, that's his rat city. He put them in a pen, he provided them with everything that was the heart's desire of rats, and he saw he looked to see what's happened, what was happening. This, he thought, was a rat's utopia. But it turned out to be a rat dystopia. Because after a while, as the rat's population grew, the rats divided up into those who were dominant and those who were less dominant. They fought for their territory. And some of the rats in these very overcrowded situations became extremely ill. And this competition actually prevented the rats from reproducing after they got to a certain point. This work was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And perhaps the most powerful symbol of this was what Calhoun called a behavioral sink. Now, he made his rat cities look more and more, as he could, like human cities. And he found that in these rat cities, a certain number of rats who were excluded from these most dominant situations in which rats lived with, a ha with their own harem and lived a, a life of luxury, smoking and drinking and generally enjoying themselves. But a number of rats were unable to live like that and they became crowded and concentrated in these behavioral sinks where they were unable to carry their pregnancy to a full term where they fell short in their maternal functions, as he put it there, where they had many behavioral disturbances, including sexual deviations, uh, frenetic overactivity, pathological withdrawal, emerging only to eat, drink, and move about only when other populations were asleep. This idea that density itself produced these behavioral sinks became an exceptionally powerful one in American social policy. And the argument was that it was this general adaptation syndrome. It was stress that was driving these forms of pathological behavior so that when rats were overcrowded, they were stressed. And when they were stressed, they developed all these disorders of body and behavior. So perhaps, perhaps, if this was stress in rats, perhaps this would be stress in humans. <clears throat> and indeed, the American urbanist Lewis Mumford said exactly this when talking in the 1960s about the riots that were emerging in the middle of the American cities. No small part of this ugly barbarization, he said, has been due to sheer physical congestion, a diagnosis now partly confirmed with scientific experiments with rats, for when they're placed in equally congested quarters, they exhibit the same symptoms of stress, alienation, hostility, sexual perversion, parental incompetence, and rabid violence that we now find in the megalopolis. 
Well, I think we've heard those kinds of descriptions of certain population groups before. But now we know the answer is crowding, its density, and rats hold the key. And between 1956 and 1968, all these people, who if you are a social scientist, you will, you, will remember, you will see these names and think of these names as the greatest names in your discipline, gathered together two or three times a year as the Committee on Physical and Social Environmental Variables as Determinants of Mental Health under Leonard Duell and under John, John Calhoun, the Rat Cities guy, uh, to see if they could understand what it was exactly about the environment that caused the stress that led to mental ill health. Now, I wish I could tell you that they had found the answer, but in fact, they didn't find the answer at all. And why didn't they find the answer? Well, the answer was, well, to quote uh, Celia, everybody knows what stress is and nobody knows what stress is. And to quote somebody who was uh, the nemesis of Stressia, John Mason, of Celia, John Mason, perhaps the single most remarkable historical fact concerning the term stress is its persistent widespread use in biology and medicine in spite of almost chaotic disagreement over its definition. So everybody knows what stress is and nobody knows what stress is. But one thing became clear, and this is why I've gone through this uh, ratty uh, diversion. One thing became clear, which you probably all knew right at the very beginning, which is that human beings aren't really that much like rats. And human beings aren't like rats, well probably rats aren't like rats either in this sense, that stress is not an objective feature of the form of life which a rat has. Or well, it's certainly not an objective feature of the form of life that a human has. Stress is not objective, it is subjective. Again and again and again, the research showed that there's no objective thing, noise, density, crowding, isolation. None of these factors on their own produces stress. What produces stress is not the objective factor, but the way in which the human being understands it. Stress for you is not stress for me. Kwame lives in the middle of this cacophonous city as happy as Larry. For me, I step outside the door and it's terrifying. I live right in the middle of London in Bloomsbury. Uh, on Saturday night, I shut myself up in my little apartment on the fifth floor, but what I see if I ever have to pop out for a pint of milk, if people buy pints of milk these days, is thousands and thousands of people coming into the middle of London to enjoy themselves because of noise, because of crowding, because of density. Their stress is not my stress. So what does that mean? That means something actually really rather important. There's a social neuroscientist called John Cacioppo who's worked on loneliness. Now loneliness can cause all sorts of illnesses, but loneliness is not solitude. Loneliness, the loneliness that causes illness, is not the number of social encounters that you have every day, every week, or every year. It's whether you have chosen or not chosen those encounters. It's whether you code those as isolation, because you think of others as having these social encounters, or whether it's solitude that you yourself has chosen. Like it or lump it, then, when it comes to stress, when it comes to solitude, when it comes to any of these things that we think give rise to mental disorders, as in those maps that I showed you at the beginning, what's important is not the objective, but the subject, the way in which the human beings make sense of the world in which they live, which should not surprise us, does not surprise us as social scientists and will not surprise any of us who are human beings, which I think is the majority of people in this room right now. So what does that mean? That means that everything that we understand about human culture, about human language, about human meaning, it's those things that make worlds stressful or unstressful. 
It's those things that give rise to resilience or not resilience. And if we're looking for mechanisms, that is to say, if we're looking at what translates the outside to the inside, how adversity gets under the skin, unfortunately, what we have to do is to begin to look at the way in which human beings individually and collectively live their lives in cities and not at these global factors like density and so on and so forth. As one of the leading stress res researchers uh, these days puts it very nicely, brain drives, the brain drives the stress response. It's undoubtedly the case that when people perceive themselves, experience themselves as feeling stressed, it does set off a hormonal cascade which, if it is continued, does produce the kinds of physical and mental disorders which stress researchers have pointed to. But it's the brain, its perceptions, its beliefs, its cultural understandings which drive that stress uh, response. Unfortunately, unfortunately for those like me who are kind of interested in what those cultural understandings, what those forms of life actually are like, what you see again and again in these uh, diagrams, cartoons as the scientists like to call them, is that there's quite a lot of detail here, but here in the box goes the environment. Environmental stressors, work, home, neighborhood, major life events, trauma and abuse. Okay, that's about all we know about these things. So this is one, and, and McEwen and his brother Craig, Bruce and his brother Craig, who's a sociologist, are about the most sophisticated researchers here. They believe that the brain drives the stress response. This is from some work with rats, which kind of indicates how the brain drives the stress response. So how that this goes back to some of the arguments that I mentioned very briefly right at the very beginning. It's because the brain is plastic, because these areas like the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex can grow or can uh, reduce as a result in particular of the uh, genes that are expressed in them. And those gene expressions are mediated by glutocorticoids, as they're called. Those are hormones that affect the immune system, like cortisol. Cortisol is released when an, uh, an individual believes, or a rat believes, that they are stressed, and a whole bunch of other hormones are released. They affect the development and product, uh, incorporation of new neurons, new brain cells. Perhaps, as I said, they do this by affecting the way in which genes are expressed or activated over the life course. McEwen's focus himself is what he calls toxic stress in childhood, which is the argument that children who live in these very uh, uh, um, dis disrupted uh, environments, and indeed people, uh, kids in refugee camps, experience this feeling of stress without the opportunity of fight or flight, uh, so it becomes a kind of chronic condition. Experience this quite regularly, and this has lifetime consequences for them. But our knowledge of the environmental factors is uh, very sketchy. As I've said, one of the mechanisms by which people think this works is epigenesis. That is to say the importance that we're now beginning to realize, not of the genes you inherit, but how these, those genes express themselves from over a lifetime, from the moment of conception, if not before, how cells are activated, uh, genes are activated or disactivated in certain parts of the body. That's what generates new nerve cells. That what, that's what leads to the expansion or the contraction of particular brain areas. And that perhaps is one mechanism by which adversity gets under the skin. Uh, one of the, real, uh, the leading social epidemiologists working on this, Sandro Galea, and his group has done some work in, in Detroit, uh, with uh, residents in Detroit, looking at the relationship between uh, their experience of tra traumatic incidents uh, and uh, gene expression. Um, and they conclude here that cumulative traumatic burden may leave a molecular footprint in those who've experienced those traumatic incidents. So here, trauma generate or the perception of being in a traumatic situation, often the perception that you are 
in a situation when you're threatened with no opportunity of escape, not actual be being beaten up, but the perception that you're constantly under threat and that you cannot get away from it, that changes gene expression uh, and that cha those changes in gene expression find their uh, consequences in mental illness. They too argue that it's through understanding these mechanisms that we can begin to think about how those wider social factors begin to get under the skin. This is uh, Leda Bogan and, uh, and uh, Maya Lindenberg again and, and their group arguing that what we need, therefore, is a kind of integration between what we understand going on at the neurobiological level, at the molecular level, and what we understand as going on at the social level if we are to begin to get to grips with these well-known patterns of mental ill health across urban space. It's not enough to point to factors. It's not enough to point to crowding. No doubt green space is good, but it's not enough to point to green space. We have to go beyond that to look at, to look at mechanisms. And if we do go beyond that to look at mechanisms, perhaps there are ways in which we can begin to think about how we can transform or understand city environments. Because I'm, I'm just coming to my conclusion now. We have to be kind of quite careful when we talk about the city. The city is not one thing, and even the very overcrowded areas of the city are not one thing. Uh, that's, uh, those are favelas in Rio, where we've done a little bit of work. This is Pudong in Shanghai, if you've ever been to Shanghai. Completely different environment, completely different form of life. This is Mumbai, this is London, uh, this is Toronto. Um, a city is a name. It's a name that we give, but it's a name that can mislead uh, as well as inform. And if we're really to understand what's going on at the level at which individuals live their lives, we have to recognize, begin to understand cities as these complex ecological environments. And the ecological environments in which human beings make their lives. Human beings are not passive creatures in this. They're not mere recipients uh, of an urban environment. They struggle to make sense of their lives always, almost always, in relation with others. We're doing some work in Shanghai, a city of 26, 28 million people, uh, of whom one third are migrants who've come into the city in the last 10 or 15 years from rural areas. Uh, when we asked the major uh, mental health center in Shanghai, what they knew of the mental health of migrants, they said nothing because the migrants never use a mental health center. Uh, the data never records the mental health status of migrants in Shanghai because some of you may know that in China uh, people have residence permits. Uh, they have residence permits, huku, which are divided between urban and rural. And the data, only refer, data on mental ill health in cities only refers to people who have urban huku, uh, but none of the migrants, or very few of the migrants, have urban huku. So we don't know very much about the mental health status of a third of the population of Shanghai. And the same is true of other cities. What we do know about Shanghai, so our research here, uh, called Mental Health Migration in the Mega City, is trying to link up these different areas. It's trying to get to grips with how you make that relationship between the external environment and the way in which people live their lives. And we're trying to find some ways of understanding the way in which people live their lives. In particular, we're developing with some colleagues at King's College London uh, an app called the Urban Mind app, which polls individuals five times a day over a two-week period asks them whether they're feeling anxious, whether they're feeling sad, whether they're feeling excited, asks them whether they're with other people or on their own, 
asks them whether they uh, can see grass, can they see trees, can they see buildings, uh, asks them to take a picture, sorry, that thing which you can't see, this has been piloted, These are, they just, people take pictures, but actually they take pictures of the, where they're standing, which aren't tremendously informative, um, but uh, uh, that's, that's just like what the app looks like. Um, apps look like apps, um, but uh, with the wonders of GPS these days, we can pinpoint exactly where people were standing at the time when they completed these apps. Interesting thing about the pilot that uh, my colleague Andrea Michelli did, that's the group of us who are doing it, is that they put the pilot on their website planning to use it in London, and within a month they found it was being used all over the world. So it's a way of getting hold of very large populations and combining that with very detailed ethnographic work. So we have an urban ethnographer who's been living in the mi one particular migrant street in Shanghai for the last year. Um, and just coming to my conclusion here, um, what you find, and this is a very, very stressed area. It's a stressed area partly because Shanghai is trying to free itself from its reputation of having lots of semi-legal factories that produce very cheap goods uh, which are then exported, largely done by migrant labor, trying to get rid of that and bring in uh, high-quality white-collar workers rather than all these low-quality migrants. Uh, so they've been raising down the factories. So the people on this street live in a condition of considerable uncertainty uh, with their factories destroyed, having to move somewhere else to get work and so on. And yet the thing that we find again and again and again, uh, if you talk to people, if you live with them, is the way in which they negotiate their way around these urban spaces, how they domesticate and manage their stress, how they learn to live lives in situations of insecurity, in combination with others, in small, tight-knit groups, in combination with others, which helps them build. Resilience is not an individual characteristic. It's something that grows out of these uh, transactions amongst others, living often in situations which you might think externally are those of extreme suffering. Yes, of course, they have bad lives. They don't believe they are suffering from mental illness. They don't seek mental health support. If they seek any support at all, it is from their colleagues. Is the solution to a situation like that to bring in a team of psychiatric uh, experts? Or is this perhaps not to medicalize their condition? Are they wrong in not thinking that they are suffering from mental ill health? in these hard situations where they're feeling a lot of heart pressure and often having difficulty sleeping? Should we medicalize those conditions? Or should we perhaps recognize what are at the roots of these collective forms of resilience and seek to make use of those people themselves them and their peers who are perhaps best placed to give one another support rather than bringing in experts from outside? So, just to conclude, we think that there is a way of trying to understand these kinds of urban experiences bringing together a really thick description of how people live and experience their lives with a recognition of the neurobiological mechanisms by which those experiences of life get inside. It's not enough just to count up the factors to assist assess the level of deprivation. You have to understand the ways in which the cities kind of compose the lives of the people who live there and how they, in their turn, manage those forms of existence. I've been, some of you may know my work on biopolitics. I've been quite influenced by recent writing by uh, Didier Fassan, uh, who's worked a lot on humanitarianism, and who argues that we know a lot about the politics of life, but another politics of life is possible, which thinks of life as both social and biological, written through a body and lived uh, through cells, lived through the living forms of human beings, recognizing the social life of the city and the molecular life of individuals as being entangled with one another. 
So this is our research team in the UK, myself, colleague Nick Manning, uh, Jesse Lee, Ash Amin, a wonderful geographer at Cambridge, Des Fitzgerald at, at, at Harvard, uh, sorry, at Cardiff. We're working with researchers in Fudan uh, under the leadership of Fu Hua. Um, our researcher, Lisa Richaud, has lived on the streets uh, in, uh, in Shanghai and uh, contributed the ethnography. We're beginning the work in Sao Paulo, working with Laura Andrade. And this was all kicked off by some uh, Urban Brain four workshops that uh, people came to from around the world to try and think about these things, amongst whom I'm delighted to say was Kwame McKenzie, uh, which in a roundabout way accounts for me being here tonight. Thank you very much. So one hour, 200 years, um, a demonstration of how you can expand people's minds without drugs. Um, you know, amazing canvas that has been drawn and uh, you know, we have not been disappointed by the depth and the breadth and uh, also the humour uh, of this talk. Now, we're really happy to have uh, Elliot Capel, who's the Chief Resiliency Officer for the City of Toronto, uh, here today. Uh, in, his, in this role, he's leading the development of Toronto's resilience strategy and the city's participation in the global 100 Resilient Cities Network. Uh, a native Torontonian, Elliot has also held various roles in the Government of Ontario and worked with Global Affairs Canada. He is passionate about adaptation, urban development, uh, the environment, and wildlife. Elliot has also worked in over, sorry, in over 20 countries internationally, including Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. He has worked with and for a range of government clients, including international donors such as uh, DFID and USAID, uh, the, Mill the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the World Bank, IFC, and the UNDP. He is previously the head of North America. It's amazing. It says you were previously the head of North America. <laughs> Mr. Trump, you get everywhere, eh? All right. Um, so, something missing there. Uh, but you can tell them which North America. Uh, and the head of infrastructure and climate change strategy at the Adam, at the Adam Smith International a consulting firm. We're thrilled to have you and also thrilled in the fact that Toronto has a resiliency officer and uh, we're really interested in your reflections on uh, Professor Rose's talk and also uh, tell us a little bit about what you're hoping to do. Please, Elliot. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's quite an introduction. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie and Professor Rose. I said I would try and be brief, but I've written down so many things from that 200-year uh, history that I, it's hard to know where to start. I'll just give you a, a brief overview of sort of what uh, I'm hoping to achieve as the Chief Resilience Officer in Toronto, and then reflect a little bit on the role of mental health within the resilience strategy. So uh, as Dr. McKenzie noted, we're part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network, and we've heard it several times today. Obviously, more people living in cities uh, than ever. Uh, and also cities are experiencing two other large forces, climate change and globalization. And it's in that context that the Rockefeller Foundation created the 100 Resilient Cities Network. First of all, the theory being more people being uh, living in cities. If you make those cities more resilient, uh, then you help more people. But also by creating a network, the cities can learn from each other. And we think about urban resilience as resilience to shocks and distresses, right? And the shocks are pretty obvious, I think, to a lot of people, things like hurricanes, terrorism, etc. The stresses are less obvious, right? They're the things that weaken the urban fabric uh, day to day. I often say that stresses are the things that actually stress us out about living in Toronto, uh, the obvious link to mental health there, so congestion, uh, equity, uh, affordable housing, uh, et cetera. We're just getting started in the Toronto uh, Resilient Strategy process. Uh, it's a two-year process where we will develop and then start implementing the strategy. Uh, and so we're not fully there in terms of our ideas, but I can tell you that we'll likely work in three areas. 
The first one, uh, core to the mandate, is climate change adaptation. Uh, and the focus there will be on integrating climate change adaptation and mainstreaming it through uh, the city's policies and processes. And for those people here who think that that sounds like policy wonk nonsense, I will point you to the experience uh, of Houston today. Uh, obviously, you know, we think that Hurricane uh, Harvey, that the intensity of the event was increased due to climate change, but in fact the impacts were also uh, increased due to a failure to adapt to climate change at the urban level. For example, a failure to integrate climate change adaptation into land use policy, uh, building codes, ecological protection, uh, the transportation uh, project preparation and development, all those things likely uh, worsen the impact for the people living there. The second work area is likely to be on emergency management. Uh, we are entering the 20th year of the megacity, uh, the megacity of Toronto. And there's a question of, you know, are we set up for 21st century shocks? Um, you know, extreme heat uh, is probably a new shock for Torontonians, and we need to think about whether institutionally we're ready for those sorts of things. And then lastly, uh, we're thinking a lot about neighborhood level resilience. You know, we know that in shocks, um, you know, governments, emergency services, so on, we can't be everywhere at once. Uh, and it's really often time left to neighborhoods to uh, fend for themselves. Indeed, there will be a, a strong focus uh, here on tower neighborhoods. We have about 200,000 people in this city who are uh, living at or below the poverty line in towers built before 1985. Those are mostly towers which are located uh, in the inner suburbs, and those are the populations that we view as most vulnerable. So again, three areas of work, climate change adaptation, uh, emergency preparedness and management, uh, and neighborhood level resilience. And let me just sort of rewind and go, and go backwards through them as I reflect on, on what we just heard. Uh, in the concluding slides, we heard that resilience is spatial, and that's really what the neighborhood level work is all about. It's about building social capital at the neighborhood level. We know that neighborhoods which have higher levels of social capital tend to do better in shocks, tend to recover better, uh, tend to bounce back better. But uh, just as we said about uh, uh, one of the earlier slides, Everyone knows what social capital is, and nobody knows what social capital is. And so I would say that probably more work is needed uh, from the 100 Resilient Cities Network to understand better what social capital means at the neighborhood level. I would, however, uh, guess, and I do think that it's likely, that resilient neighborhoods have strong social capital and also are better for mental health. Um, that's sort of the environmental stressors box that we had up in the corner that we, we didn't delve into. In the second area of work, um, when it comes to emergency management, uh, I think there's a clear link for mental health, and particularly when we think about long-term recovery, right? When you think about something like Harvey or Katrina or Sandy, clearly the cleanup effort lasts a long time, um, sometimes a decade, sometimes longer. Uh, and in that time, I think there'll be clear, uh, a clear role for institutions like the Wellesley Institute um, to uh, think about mental health within cities. I just want to give you an example from our, our stakeholder consultation. We've been speaking to a lot of large groups, a lot of people one-on-one, -on -one, and we were speaking with a group, uh, I can't remember the title of the group now, but it was, let's say, young people, right, as some sort of youth cabinet. Um, and reflecting, talking about terrorism, that group said, we're not actually afraid of a terrorist incident and what it may do to our lives or to our property or to our loved ones. What we're worried about is the long-term effect of such an incident on the mental health of the city, in that Toronto is, an, is uh, we think, you know, an inclusive place where people use the motto, diversity is our strength, and there's a concern about what happens if we should suffer a large shock and what impact that will have on the collective mental health of the city. And again, the last area, climate change adaptation, you know, this really boils down to, in many ways, making our cities uh, greener and about ecological uh, protection. We know that parks are good for floods, we know that parks are good for the urban heat island effect, and I would also posit that parks are good for mental health. Uh, we, we call it a cliche, uh, but when you think about using parks for active transport, um, more green space for a place for people to come together, uh, I would uh, point you to go to the park nearest my house, Trinity Bellwoods, and go look at the children's playground on a weekend uh, and see how the community comes together, not just the children, but uh, the parents uh, and the grandparents. And so I would say that perhaps it is cliche, but green spaces are good for mental health. In any case, as I look through those three areas and I think about the presentation that we just had, I think there's a clear link between mental health and resilience, and I look forward to working with our colleagues, Cam H. Wellesley Institute and other places, to see how we can work together uh, to bring the two pieces of work um, closer together uh, over the next two years. Thank you.
thank you, everybody. Um, I think what sometimes happens when you have these big issues uh, where we've had a hundred years of trying to deal with it is that uh, we always looking for a quick fix to a complex problem. And um, we sometimes get dissatisfied because we haven't had a quick fix. Uh, we develop heroes, and we've got a couple of heroes here, expecting them to come and tell us exactly what we need to do. Uh, but some of what we've heard is about the fact and the process of us thinking it through as uh, social beings in a community is part of what creates community, but also creates resilience. And so there's work is put back on us for us to do to create community. And I was really taken by this idea that people are worried that um, the sort of a, a terrorist attacks could damage our community rather than the damage the people and that the community is so important. That's actually very heartening to, to me. So what we've heard, you've heard the history of stress uh, and mental health in the city. Um, you've heard a bit about how we're thinking about that in the past and sort of might bit, bit about how we might think about it in the future. You've heard a bit about how city leaders such as Elliot might use this information uh, to think about resilient cities and building social capital in the city. And you've heard uh, a lot about the fact that there are lots of things we don't know. Uh, but there are actually loads of things we do know. I think it's important not to get disheartened. Uh, people will tell you that, uh, I think it was um, Einstein who said that uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome uh, is a, men a definition of mental illness. Yeah, you've heard that, yeah? Uh, and uh, so you might get disheartened and think, going over this and thinking about stress in the city as people have been doing for the last hundred years, this is a waste of time. More understanding is a waste of time. Trying to bring different people together is a waste of time. Uh, but the truth is, uh, this was one of the cases where Einstein was wrong. Yeah, yeah, I laugh. Well, every, every one of you would have tried to open a jar. And every time, when you try and open a jar, you do the same thing over and over again. But because you've done the same thing each time, it's actually different every time. And you're building on what's come before. And I think one of the things we're going to try and do today, and where this is a launching off point, is we've got 100 years of history of trying to open this up. We've got new people coming in like Elliot who are trying to build something. And I think we shouldn't be disheartened and think that we're doing the same thing over and over again. Because we're not, we're actually building on what's happened before. And that gives us a launching off point to go forward. And so I think, I think uh, stay optimistic, I would. I wanted to uh, thank um, the staff at PSSP and also the staff at Wellesley Institute, all who've been uh, involved in uh, bringing this together because you know that uh, getting you all in a room, getting people, international experts and Elliot and everybody on stage to uh, talk uh, through these sorts of things and present is actually difficult and I wouldn't mind if you might give them a round of applause. If that's okay. It would be great if you give a round of applause and perhaps a chair uh, to uh, Professor Nick Rose and Elliot Capel. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'd personally like to thank our hosts here at uh, the ROM and also the TCC for the soundtrack to the event. Um, but most of all, uh, it, really sincerely thank everybody for coming out. First week back uh, after um, uh, the summer break, great crowd with great questions, and it's really the people and it's your involvement that make these sorts of events come alive. And so thank you very much uh, for turning up and goodbye.